speakers will be Jim and Joy Pinto, hosts of At Home with Jim and Joy. And they're really a dynamic duo of the pro-life movement who've spent their life fighting the villains of the culture of death here, not in Gotham City, but in Birmingham City at least. And uh, of course you know them from their show and also they draw on their experiences as husband and wife. They tackle marriage, family, pro-life issues with our EWTN weekly program, multiple times a week, three times a week. And of course, uh, you've got Jim with the Media Missionaries and Joy also with Her Choice, which is a pregnancy resource center. And they've been at the forefront of many aspects of the pro-life movement and have particular solidarity with the pre-born, dealing with minorities and the disenfranchised across the board if somebody's in need, they've been there. They're effective and passionate communicators. I think you can attest to that from this talk coming up and also from just watching them over the years on the network. And uh, they believe in life, marriage, and the family, and that they're all part of God's plan to continue to transform the world. Again, Birmingham Zone, by way of New Jersey, Jim and Joy Pinto. Welcome, and we are so glad to be here. This is my beloved Jim. We're going to do like a little tag team wrestling. I'm going to go first, and then Jim will finish up. So um, we're so grateful to be here and to see you all. And as we know, the beautiful theme of this beautiful conference is I am the living bread. And so what if we all received the next reception of our Eucharist as if it was our first, as if it was our last, as if it was our only. It would be a great difference in our souls. I want you to just close your eyes for a second and think about the first time that you received First Communion. The first time, were you six, were you seven, were you beautifully adorned, or were you an adult and you came through the RCIA program? And maybe you were coming in all alone, and maybe you were coming in and you had family members who were not supportive of that journey, but you were going to come cost what it might, because you believed in the body, blood, soul, and divinity to be present in the Eucharist. You know, I'm going to tell you the bad news first. The bad news is, the polls are out, and we've all heard it, is that 70% of Catholics believe that it's just a symbol that I'm not really receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. That's the bad news. But the good news is the 30%, and I would like to believe that all of you here are that 30% who believe, yes, it is the body, blood, soul, and divinity. So I'm a convert. And I had to, Jim, you know, was an Episcopal priest for 22 years, and we took this journey. Jim did first. I came, maybe not so happy, but Jim was following truth and authority. And I just loved Jesus. And I just wanted to be wherever Jesus wanted me to be, but I really had no idea it was going to be in Catholic land. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. So... I'm a convert, and so when, when we left Protestant land and we came to the Catholic Church, I had to go through that, you know, RCIA program. And, um, and it was very humbling for me, just going to tell you. Um, I was the pastor's wife. I believed in my tradition in the Episcopal Church that I was receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity. Because in the Episcopal Church, it could be whatever you really wanted it to be. It could be a memory, it could be in remembrance, whatever. That's why we left. Anyway, so 
I had to wait. I had to wait. I had to go to Mass and go up and do this and get a blessing. And I would go back to my pew crying. Week after week after week. Because I wanted Jesus. I was like the deer panting for the water. My soul was longing after. I believed, I believed. I wanted to come in, like let me come in. And so we were coming under the authority of the, of the Catholic Church and we waited. And so one day after mass, I grabbed the priest who was Father Noel Danielowitz. He was a Franciscan and I grabbed him by his stole. And I said, Father, I can't wait anymore. I need Jesus, like you gotta give me Jesus. And he said, well, Joy, you know, you have to wait until Easter vigil, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and so he said, but why don't you try Eucharistic adoration? I was like, well, I don't know Eucharistic adoration. I'm Protestant. Like, what? What do I do? What, do I, what, do I, what does that mean? So he said, come into the chapel, and I'll show you. So he came into the chapel, and then I started to adore, and I started to love, and I started just to be with Jesus. And it was a step closer, but I wanted him. I wanted him. And so that night when we came in and we went and all made our confession, three of my four grown children came in with me and our son-in-law, Nate, and we, um, we made our confession that Friday and that Saturday we came in and we were at the Easter vigil and I said to the priest, I said, you know, Father, I'm not going to be responsible for what's going to happen to me because I've been waiting so long. I, I'm not responsible. I could implode. I could explode. I don't know what's going to happen. But you are going to give me the bread of heaven, my Lord, my love. I can't believe this. And so I went up and he said, the body of Christ. And he put Jesus on my tongue. And my head went boom, straight into his chest. And I just wept and wept. In front of all these people, I didn't care. I didn't care. I had Jesus. He was back inside of me, and it changed me. It changed me. And then my children and my son-in-law were behind me like, Mom, we have been waiting too. Like, you need to move along, you know. And I graciously moved along, but then just got back to my pew and just wept and wept and wept. And is it emotional? Yeah, it should be emotional. God Almighty is coming and living inside of you and me. We should have a response. The interior of us is consuming him, and he is giving us the opportunity to consume us. More of Jesus, less of you. More of Jesus, less of you. That's the journey to holiness. That's how we do this. And it's so beautiful. So uh, St. Francis of Assisi said this, Man should tremble, the world should quake, all heaven should be deeply moved when the Son of God appears on the altar in the hands of the priest. Yes, so that's important. Well, here we are in this time where the United States bishops, Catholic bishops, have said, we're going to go into a Eucharistic revival because of the bad news that was coming out, that 70% of the people who sit in the pews don't even believe. We catechized wrong. Or the witness of who we're really consuming is a bad witness. And we don't look any different than the world. 
And the only place that has the answer for all the ills of this world right now, as dark as this day is, is the church. And it's you and it's me. So how do we prepare? How do we go? Well, we go to confession. We need to make sure our souls are clean and pure and holy to the best of our ability. The bishops want us to believe that what we are receiving is the body, blood, and soul divinity. And if you don't believe it, just ask Jesus to help you. Say, Lord, help my unbelief. I don't believe. He'll help you because he wants you to believe. Ask the Blessed Mother the mother of the word of God to pray for you, that she would help you to see and know and to receive what you, are, what you are receiving and believe it with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We need to worship Jesus. And Deacon uh, Harold shared about it this morning about knowing the liturgical silence. There's so much noise in the world. We need liturgical silence. Wait. When you go up to receive, I'm saying three things to Jesus. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I trust in you. And I know at that reception of Jesus coming into me, me, this sinner, is going to change me for all eternity. I believe it. You see, I gave up a lot to be Catholic, and I ain't playing being Catholic. <laughs> I'm just not. I believe. And if you don't, and if, if, you, if, you're cold, if your heart is cold and your faith is just waning, ask the Holy Spirit to help you upon consumption of him that you would believe he would change you for all eternity. And there, the bishops are asking us to give and be the best versions of ourselves. You know, one of the ways to learn about the Eucharist is to read about the saints in the Eucharist. I mean, the saints have had some unbelievable experiences with the Eucharist. That will set your heart on fire. And so we have to learn how to be a great light in this dark, dark time. You know, I was in church with our grandsons, and this was before COVID, and it was RJ and James, and they were four. And I'm married to this great man here for 46 years. Yeah. Yeah. But make no mistake about it, it's Jim, it's Joy, and where's that crucifix? It's Jesus. Yeah, that's what makes you go 46 years. Because mm -hmm. I'm just not that nice. <laughs> and so I'm in Mass, and this was before COVID, and Jim was a Eucharistic minister at that time, and so he, we sat in the back of the church, and Jim had to get up to distribute um, the precious blood of Jesus. And so the grandsons looked at me and they were like, what, what, where's Bobo going? So I said, okay, I gotta explain this to these four-year-olds. Um, what, and they hadn't made their first communion, you know, and, and they're both being raised in Catholic homes. And so I'm trying to figure out how well their parents have been instructing them. Anyway, so we, we're there and um, I said, well, you know, Babo and the priest, the priest is going to give them Jesus in the Eucharist, and Babo's going to give him the blood. And, um, and they're looking at me like, what? And I said, well, you see all the people in line? Yes. Well, they're going up for superpowers. <laughs> so they go, superpowers? I said, yes, superpowers. Because some of us are broken. Some of us need healing emotionally, physically, spiritually. 
Some of us have miseries and sorrows and despair. You know why? Because we're human beings. We're just trying to find our way. God knew it was going to be hard. And that's why he gave us the best that he could ever give us was himself, is food for the journey. So you don't have to grow weary in doing well. And so they're going up there and they're going to get their superpowers and they're going to come back and they're going to be great. And they're looking at me. And I said, great, like, are they going to punch? And I said, no, they're going to be kind. And they're going to be patient. And they're going to be forgiving. And they're going to have a better attitude. Because that's what Jesus wants to do for you and for me. And that's what the Eucharist does. It changes us. It changes us. And so, what do we have to do? What we have to do is we have to pray. We have to fast. We have to pray for all our fallen away Catholic family members. And we've seen so many people here from all over the, we have Canadians, we have people here from California and Colorado, I mean from all over Florida, people that have come from all over. Why? Because the Holy Spirit drew you here because of that little Italian nun who came to Irondale, Alabama. Why Irondale, Alabama? Right? And if you've been to Hansville and you've been to the shrine, that's a miracle. And what is Mother Angelica all about? The Eucharist. Lord, give us all eyes to see and ears to hear and to receive you, Jesus, like we've never received you before. And we've all been called for a time such as this, to be alive right now. So right here in Birmingham, it's going to start with you and it's going to start with me. All of us here at EWTN, God has done an amazing thing. And the, the Catholic bishops are wanting it to spill out in every diocese all over the country. And you know, as America goes, so goes the world. And if America makes abortion illegal in the United States of America, the whole world will. Fulton Sheen has said this, the broken minds and the tortured hearts testify to the fact that nothing can satisfy the soul hunger of man except a nourishment suited for his soul and its aspirations for the perfect. Man's soul, being spiritual, demands a spiritual food in the order of grace, this, define, this divine food is the Eucharist or the communion of man with Christ and Christ with man. I mean, how could this be? How could we explain this? You know, Father Wade got up here and Deacon Harold, and they were taught, it's a mystery. You can't explain a mystery. But you have to participate in it. All of you have to participate in it. And you have to say, Jesus, I'm all in. Because he was all in. He spared nothing. He was all in so that he could give you life and me life. And to give it abundantly. You know, as a Catholic, you can receive the Eucharist every single day. Nobody's going to starve here. Thank God. I work at a pregnancy medical center with my husband, Jim, and I see on a daily basis the people who are running hard to satisfy their souls. And I'm telling you, I don't know if you know it, but everybody is smoking weed. And it's not your father's weed anymore. It's different weed. And people are coming in and they're psychotic. It's different. 
We have to pray. We have to pray for our children. We have to pray for our grandchildren. Because the devil has three tricks. He's come to lie, kill, and destroy. So, we, as men and women of God, we have to draw our sword and say, Oh, no devil, not today. Right? And we have to be those people of God. St. John Vianney said this, there is nothing so great as the Eucharist. If God had something more precious, he would have given it to us. God, give us eyes to see. When we come to Mass, we need to give him all of our heartaches, all of your sorrows, all of your miseries, and you need to be in intimate union with him everything you know he knows the worst about you he knows the worst about me and for whatever reason he's still in love with us because he loves us unconditionally you know I'm a mother I have four kids I could tell you I didn't do that all right I was that mother who loved my children on conditions and I said to Jim after parenting, we were, the kids were in their 20s, I said, you know, in the beginning, we should have said this, the child who hurts us the least gets the most. <laughs> right? Because, you know, those children, they'll rip your heart out and leave you for dead some. <laughs> and, but then you have to go to the Eucharist. Oh, that's the, my only place of refuge. Nobody can console a mother's heart like Jesus can. Nobody. And you get to go into adoration, go face to face, face to face, and just adore him and be with him and pour out your heart to him. Just tell him. You know, Mother Angelica always exhorts us and tells us, I hear it time and time again, have you told Jesus you love him today? And I make it an intention. I think I'm up to where I know, intentionally, I'm telling Jesus I love him four times a day. And I hope I'm saying I love him by all of my other actions, and especially loving my beloved Jim. Yeah, because we're a mess without Jesus. And God wants to help us to love more. He wants to help us to trust him more. And he wants to help us to serve him more. Always more of Jesus and less of me. And I know right now, as dark as this day is, that you and I have to go out from this place today and we get sent out every Sunday from Mass. Not to go home and to hide it under a bushel, but you better tell somebody what Jesus did for you. And you say, oh, I'm not an evangelist. I can't do that. Then love your husband like he's never been loved before. Be the best mother, the best mother-in-law, the best grandmother, the best grandfather. Be that best human being that you could possibly be. The world is hungry for the truth. Don't shrink back. You have the power to do it. You, you are. You have been anointed and equipped. Don't shrink back. If you're afraid, say this. Jesus, I'm afraid. You know, 365 times in the Bible, do you know how many times Jesus says to us? Do not be afraid for every day. Because he knows every day we are afraid. But he's empowered us with the truth to go and tell and to be light and salt and hope and peace and joy. You know, every time I go into a counseling room, I say a prayer because I'm having a power encounter. I have a girl in there who's all she's wanting to do is have an abortion. And I'm going to go in there with God's help and all the angels and saints and love her no matter what. Even if she gets up and walks out and says, hey, thanks. Thanks for it, that I got my ultrasound. Thanks for this, but no thanks. 
love. That's tough love. To tell the truth in love with charity and clarity. Compassion is telling the truth in love. We have to tell the truth. And the world is hungry for it. Don't miss your opportunity. The greatest love story of all time is contained in a tiny white host. He is our Lord, our King. And he is alive today, just as he was 2,000 years ago. And he wants to satisfy the longing of your soul and mine. And he wants to change your marriage. He wants to change your family. He wants to change your workplace. And he wants to make a difference in the world. The problem is he needs you and me to participate with him so we can go and do what he's called us to do. So for me, until my dying breath, I hope and pray I have viaticum, food for the journey. I'm going to praise the name of Jesus and be light and salt until Jesus alone puts my little light out. God bless you. What a blessing Joy is. And uh, you think she's beautiful? I think she is. Good. <clears throat> well, that bodes well for me because, you know, Jesus taught me a long time ago. He said, Jim, you're just a stand-in for me. He said, I'm married to her. And you're standing in now physically, but I'm married to her. And I'll know your faith by the way she looks. And he means not only outward, but inward, spiritual. And when I, when I go up to receive the Eucharist, joy is always in front of me, and I, I see her walking down, and I'm just saying to the Lord, I, how does she look, Lord? <laughs> I, I mean, how does she look? Because you said, you know, the way she looks will determine where you're going, basically. You got to love somebody all the way to the grave. And that's somebody's joy for me. So I'm glad she's looking beautiful. Um, yeah. <laughs> so just a, just a few quick thoughts. I, when we were told what the theme of this time would be, I, I am the living bread. I had never really meditated upon that. And when I'm giving talks or when I was preaching sermons, that would be my main form of preparation, is to simply meditate upon the passage or the word. So for the last you know, few months or so, just meditating and, and saying, have you ever meditated upon I am? That, that that was the way God revealed himself to Moses. Poor Moses, weak in so many ways, strong in so many ways, unable to speak, whether he stuttered or whatever it was. The great nation of Egypt, he calls Moses to be the deliverer for them. You know, and then Moses is saying, who, who should I say sent me? And God says, I am. I will be who I will be. You tell him, I am sent you. I mean, the Jews don't even say that name, I am. You tell them that which is in, in, ineffable. This whole thing is ineffable. It is so great. He is so great. He is so wondrous. He cannot be defined. He is self-contained. He's the beginning and the end and the middle. Nobody creates him or makes him. He makes all thing, things, the galaxies and everything in the sea and his might and power and overcomes everything. And he says, I am that and so much more. So it's hard to speak about the name when it's ineffable. You can't define the name. And that's what the name means. You don't define me. Nobody defines me. I define you. And everything else, everywhere, for all ages and all times. I am. And we see in that John 6, the whole discourse on I am the bread of life, that they discuss 
that who are you, Jesus? Moses gave us the bread that came down. And Jesus says, Moses didn't give you that bread. My father gave you that bread. And then he makes this claim, and I often think, you know, when the Jews get on him and the leaders, and how could they do that? He is who he is. I put myself back into their shoes. And I say, I don't know if I would have believed in Jesus with a good Jewish upbringing. Because to them, he was blaspheming God. The religious would rip their robes. Jesus is before these people, outrageous. I am the bread of life. I've come down from heaven to give life to the world. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. And my flesh is food indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. Eat my body and drink my blood or you have no life in you. Well, I know how I respond to that now, of course. But for those poor men and women that are there, I am the bread of life. Who says that? I am the light of the world. He who comes to me will never be in darkness. I'm the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. Everybody knows that God the Father is the shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I am am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live. I'm the way. I am. He's saying, I am that same I am with God with skin, God made poor, God with a face. I am. You are face to face with I am. And for me, I am the true vine. Before Abraham was, I am. I am. I am. I mean, he's there. True existence is there. Imagine if he would have said to Moses and took it further. Moses was on his knees at the burning bush. And Moses is like, oh, okay, you know, my gosh. What if he said to Moses, and I want to come into you. I want you to eat me. He couldn't say that. The, the, Jesus, the Logos had not come yet. But we get to hear from Jesus. I am is here. He's the face of God revealed. God with skin. God made poor. And he says, eat me. You must eat me, and you must drink me. So I pray, as I did for a couple of months. I never would have done it, except I had to be up here and have something to say about something you can't really talk about, because it's ineffable. That's an assignment. And that you say it, and you think to yourself, if he comes into me, the creator of all this, I'm just going to die. He's going to kill me. I mean, how can he come into this vessel? But somehow, some way, he, he does that. He's so merciful. And so he bids us. The only way we can come, as it says in John, no one can come to me. Like, no one can receive this word unless the Father beckons him. Come to me. Come to me, you sinner. Come to me, unclean vessel. Come to me, all you who travel and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke on your neck and learn from me. I'm gentle. I'm lowly of heart. I am who I am, God the merciful, God forgiving, as well as God the creator, and who could destroy everything he created in a moment. God who needs nothing from anyone who's totally self-inclusive. But God wants us. And I think that's the most painful thing of receiving the Lord, that somebody so good who knows us inside and out says, eat me. I want to come into you and transform your life. And Joy mentioned our center, where we see over a thousand new cases a year. For years we never had... Uh, the Lord's presence in a tabernacle. Some years back, Father John Paul from EW10 asked our bishop if we could have the tabernacle with the real presence of Jesus. And when I finally got to pray before the Lord in our center, which we never had before, I would pray as I prayed before he was there. So we, we're, doing, we're dealing with life and death every day with these women. We're seeing the babies that are going to be chemically aborted or surgically aborted. And so we always pray every day, Lord, come, be with us, Lord. Help us, Lord, do something, intervene, bring the light. And so when the Lord came, I was praying like that before him. And we can open our tabernacle and the Lord is there in the monstrous. This is what I believe I heard from him. Stop asking me to come. Because I'm here. 
He says, and you must learn to pray now. I'm not saying this is like, you know, you got to believe it. I'm just telling you what I'm. He said, when I come here, I'm not alone. My mother's here. The angels are here. The saints are here. I don't come alone. You have to learn how to pray now in the midst of all that you're facing. Stop asking me to come. Learn that I'm here and what that means for you and how you have to pray. That's another powerful thought in terms of Eucharistic adoration. That when we're on our knees, you're before the great I am. I am is there. And we bless the Lord that we're not consumed or killed. But he makes himself so small and so humble in that wafer that is his body, blood, soul, and divinity right there. So let us, let us just think about all those things. Let us meditate upon that. As, as you see the priest, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's also the I am the living bread. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. They're dead. This is the bread that leads to eternal life. He said to the woman at the well, if you knew who was talking to you, you would ask me to give you water. And I would have given you living water that will bubble up to eternal life. As that song says, there's a river of life that's flowing out of me. It makes the lame to walk. It makes the blind to see. It opens prison doors and sets the captives free. There's a river of life that's flowing out of me. Spring up, a oh well, within my soul. Spring up, a oh well, make me whole. Spring up, a oh well, and give to me that life abundantly and help me to share it with everyone. I am the bread of life is living in you, and particularly through the sacrament. We're in a Eucharistic revival time. And we have the best of intentions, and it's all written down what the revival is supposed to be about. But you know what it is? It's paper. Unless the flame of the Holy Spirit comes on what we're hoping to do and lands upon it, there ain't no revival. Only God revives. And our bishops know that. This is not a criticism. It's for us to understand. I mean, there's nothing here but words. Unless the Lord sets them aflame and we encounter him. And you will be at the pinnacle when our bishop celebrates Holy Eucharist, because guess what? Not only the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but I am who I am. I will be who I will be, the great and the mighty one. And the humble one who sacrifices his life and deigns to live within you, that really kills you. That he could be so kind to us. And he says to you, consume me and live for me. So... Let's continue to meditate, and then let's have the reality that you experience the ineffable, the ineffable coming into you and saying, consume me, and he will consume you for his honor and glory. Thank you. God bless you.